what are the risk factor um, for a child to have autism? So basically, based on the research, there's no clear um, factors or etiology to say that um, if you take this or if you do this, normally people will link it with uh, nutrition, uh, the way you eat. Uh, so they say, oh, because you lack of some milk, something gluten or something like that, so it can cause autism. But there's no um, clear evidence to suggest that it's the cause for autism. Mostly it is multifactorial. Um, it's because of the genetic factor and also the environmental factor. So among the factors that has been uh, identified um, through research is advancing age. So if a maternal or the mother uh, age more than 40 years old and the father more than 55 years old, uh, when they conceive a child, so there's a high risk for the child to have uh, autism, uh, but not necessarily, I mean, not, uh, I'm saying the high risk, not a definitive factor that they will have autistic child. So other factors include, or other risk factors include prematurity um, of less than 33 weeks of gestation, um, or if the child has a problem, lack of oxygen during birth, um, or the mother is exposed with uh, toxins during pregnancy, and also family history. So study shows uh, if you have a sibling who have diagnosed with autism, so there's a high risk that um, your other child will have autism as well. But not only autism, if the child has any other neurodevelopmental disorder like ADHD, learning disability, and so on. So that's a risk for uh, your other child to have autism. Okay, so basically, um, this is something that I take from National Autism Research Center. Okay, the pathway, how to know whether my child has autism or don't have autism, when can I identify these symptoms and things like that? So normally it begins at the routine development screening, uh, healthcare clinic at the age of 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, where you take your child for a routine checkup. So the doctor will uh, see whether the child uh, fulfills the developmental stage that they should reach by that time. So if the doctor thinks that your, your child does not uh, develop according to what it's supposed to, then they will refer to the audiologist and also to the ophthalmologist. So this is to make sure that the child don't have any hearing or visual impairment. Okay? So it means that their hearing is okay and their vision is okay. Yet they have the problem you think that the child have or not, not normal, like not like other, uh, other children. So if the hearing and the visual test uh, okay, means there's no problem at all, then proceed to the step three, which is the MCHAT screening. So this MCHAT screening can be done by the um, primary care uh, doctors, even at the, no, uh, at the clinic. Okay, so if the score at the MCHAT uh, screening indicates the risk for autism, then only uh, the doctor will refer to a uh, clinical psychologist. Some of the doctors will refer to pediatric first. Some will refer to child psychiatry. So that's okay. Uh, that's fine. Okay, and uh, then if, because like I say, uh, one autistic child and another autistic child, the symptom is not the same. So some have very mild and subtle autism symptoms and others is quite um, obvious or significant. So if it is quite obvious, so normally doctor will give the diagnosis there and then. Uh, but if it is like not really sure, the, the symptoms is quite subtle, or if you want to know their level of severity, normally they will refer to clinical psychologists to confirm the diagnosis of autism using uh, 
using CARS and GARS uh, questionnaire. So I will explain a bit about this questionnaire later on. I saw a question, but I don't have time to read it, but I will go back to that later. Okay. So after we confirm the diagnosis that the child is actually have autism and at what level, uh, whether it's mild, moderate and so on, so we will refer to um, occupational therapies and also for, uh, to speech therapies. Occupational therapies for behavior intervention and speech therapies for the communication part. Remember the autism um, to characteristic uh, divided into two, which is the communication and also the uh, behavior problem. So therefore, that's why we refer to occupational therapies and also speech therapies. And if you have um, quite a good financial, so you can enroll them in an early intervention program because early intervention program can be quite costly. Um, so early intervention program is, is it's quite comprehensive. They have uh, occupational therapies there. They have speech therapies in the program. It's like a, you send the child to um, kindergarten, but a special one uh, where you have in-house uh, occupational therapies because some have clinical psychologists and also occupational therapies in there. Okay. And also, um, parents actually entitled to, um, to apply for OKU card for the child under um, learning difficulty. Because under learning difficulty, there's like ADHD, autism, specific learning disability. So you can apply it under autism. Okay, And so uh, you are eligible to get this uh, OKU card. Okay, a lot of benefits uh, from getting this okay card actually, and you can go to the social welfare department website and look into the benefit when it comes to education. Okay, some parents are quite concerned, like, um, is it okay if I don't uh, register for OKU? You know, what if other people know that my child have uh, my child is OKU? Okay, um, I don't need all that uh, discount in utilities and things like that. Okay, but yes, uh, yes, maybe parents don't need that kind of benefit in terms of discount in utilities. But what more important is what the child can gain uh, from the education part when they have the OKU card.